Okay. Uh, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our uh, third installment of Corn Conversations here with uh, Texas Corn. Uh, today, we're glad to have you join us. I'm Executive Director David Gibson with for Texas Corn Producers Board. We have both our checkoff and our association that are housed here in our office, both our members and supporters of U.S. Grains Council who is one of our uh, key industry partners that promotes corn and corn products across the globe. A few things I will note as we start our conversation, this is a webinar format, so we are unable to see or hear those that are participating. We will have time for questions following the presentations by the speakers. To submit a question through the Zoom app, you may press the Q&A button on your screen and type in the question. If you are participating by phone, audio only, you can submit questions by email through cornconvo, C-O-R-N-C-O-N-V-O at texascorn.org or call our office at 7806-763-2676. This will be recorded today and be made available on our website at texascorn.org. Here to introduce today's speakers is Wesley Spurlock. He's a farmer from Stratford, Texas. He uh, owns, serves on our uh, Corn Producers Board and Association and is uh, one of our Texas delegates to the U.S. Grains Council. Wesley. Good morning. Promoting corn and corn product markets are a key piece of the Texas Corn Producers efforts to ultimately further the corn industry for all farmers in Texas. Collaboration with the U.S. Grains Council has been instrumental in furthering these efforts as they establish and build relationships with existing and emerging markets worldwide. Today, we have three U.S. Grains Council leaders with us, Ryan Legrand, Kurt Schultz, and Melissa George Kessler, will offer insight on the value of trade, the current state of the global trade relationships and highlights marketing markets of interest. Ryan Legrand serves as the president and CEO of the U.S. Grains Council. He has joined the council in 2015 as an assistant director and then director of the Mexico, the Council's Mexico office, where he identified and addressed all relative trade, technical, and policy related factors relative to the building and maintaining of markets for the U.S. grains and co products in Mexico. Before joining the Council, Legrand worked for Gavilon as the Director of Ingredients located in Guadalajara, Mexico. In this capacity, he managed the company's feed ingredients trading, import, and distribution throughout Mexico. Legrand also served as the Director of Exports for Hawkeye Gold, LLC, where he exported DDGs to Latin America and Asia. Legrand earned a bachelor's degree from Oklahoma State University in international business. Kurt Schultz is the Senior Director of Global Strategies for the Council. In his role, he is responsible for the development and long-term planning in support of the Council's domestic and international operations. He oversees strategic planning, program, evaluation, and special projects. Schultz joined the Council in 1999, and his career has spanned from managing international operations for the offices in Latin America, Africa, and the Mediterranean, and the Middle East, Latin American markets program activities, as well as market development and trade activities in the Western Hemisphere on behalf of the feed grains and export community. Prior to joining the council, Schultz was a senior environmental health and safety specialist with the University of Florida and held positions with the University of Virgin Islands Agricultural Research Station and the Peace Corps. He 
received his bachelor's degree in animal science from the University of California, Davis, and later received his master's in business administration from the University of Virgin Islands. Melissa George Kessler serves as the Director of Strategic Relations for the U.S. Grains Council. In this capacity, she works to strengthen relationships with the Council's supporters and domestic and international partners through strategic communications and awareness of the Council's programs. Kessler previously worked as the Director of Communications with the Council and was responsible for the design and executing of the organization's international and external communications efforts. Prior to joining the council, she ran a consulting practice focused on strategic communications and organizational effectiveness, as well as serving as the director of communications for the National Association of Wheat Growers. Kessler holds a master's degree in organizational development from the Americas University and a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Oklahoma. Ryan, Kurt, Melissa, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Wesley. Um, I'm Melissa Kessler. I'm going to start us off here and share my screen um, so we can show some slides. So we really appreciate the opportunity to be with you this morning um, for your corn conversation series. It's wonderful to be able to join farmers, um, even if it is virtually, obviously we would love to see you in person and be having this conversation, um, but this is a great alternative and we appreciate everyone who was able to log in this morning and everyone who's listening afterwards. Um, I'd like to start us off and talk a bit about what the council is and what we do for you. Um, as well as the broader context of trade in which we're working. Um, so it's important, I think, to understand our role in the agriculture industry and how we relate to the Texas Corn Board and Association. Um, the Grades Council is a market development organization focused on feed grains. So we work on corn and corn co-products, including DDGs um, and distillers corn oil, as well as ethanol. Um, as well as sorghum and then barley. So feed grains and their derivatives. And to do that, you know, we work all over the world. We work in 50 countries typically. Um, and now I would say, you know, worldwide, including in our virtual environment. Um, we have staff headquartered in all of the places that you're seeing on your screen, including regional offices in the Western Hemisphere, um, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and then um, in the Middle East and North Africa, the head that office is in North Africa. And then we have consultants and other staff, um, as well as country offices in North Asia and Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and China. Um, we have a country office also in Mexico. And through these various um, structures and staffing, um, that is how we do outreach to our customers in about more than 50 countries. Um, we really work on a basis of whatever those constraints are to grain exports and to building demand, we're going to go out and work with that. And that can be as um, kind of seemingly simple as technical education or contracting education up to you know, policy development uh, country by country or at the WTO. So the reason you know, we exist um, to help make those connections between farmers here in the US and their customers overseas is really because of the impact that trade has on farmers and on the farm economy. So, you know, I'm sure most of you on this webinar have heard this before, but um, trade and exports of agricultural goods, and the US produces enough food for about 2 billion people and we have 330 million. So we have um, an enormous productive capacity um, that we fully utilize in this country and to help truly feed the world. And um, that also helps drive our own profitability within our industry. So, you know, one in three farm acres is planted for export. This has billions of dollars of impact on each in every state in our union, including Texas. Um, and we really know that also the growth in ag exports is going to be um, where we see growth within our industry. So, you know, the vast majority of the world's population, more than 95%, lives outside of our own borders. And that's also where population growth, as we'll talk about a bit this hour, is occurring. And so going out and finding that demand 
um, overseas and being able to really capture that market share for U.S. producers and is an important part of continuing to grow your operations and continuing to support price um, to, to keep our sector as profitable as possible. We want to do a, a brief overview. So when we talk about exports, we're focused on the feed grains and on the products that we make from them, including ethanol. Um, but really, we try to look at a holistic picture of what we're exporting from this country that you are as farmers are producing. So that includes looking at corn and DDGs and ethanol and then sorghum and barley, as well as derivative products. So, you know, how much corn are you producing that goes into pork that is exported or beef that is exported or poultry that is exported? And when you put all of that together, what we see is, is that um, about half of those feed grains in all forms exports, as we call them, um, are actually corn. Another, you know, solid chunk is ethanol and, and the meat products. Um, but all told, you, you have this full picture of when you put it all together, those value added products really are becoming a, a very important part of our total exports. So in a way, you know, that seems um, that's an important piece to understand because while we obviously want to export as much corn and sorghum and barley as possible, we also want to be adding value to our products here at home and exporting those valuable products overseas to customers. Um, we're kind of willing to sell it however people want it, um, but we do like to capture that value here at home as much as we can. We look at where our ag exports going and not just, you know, the, the grain commodities that we're talking about, but ag exports in general um, and, and critical to this market. You can see these the top six markets 2018 the last year where we have really have full solid numbers. Those yellow spots are corn. Um, nice and easy to see. You can see how important that is. And then you also see, you know, the tanner spots are soybeans. Um, and then when we go back to that grain in all forms conversation, many of these markets are also big buyers of pork, which is in like a maroony color, um, and beef, which is in a red color. And that, of course, uses the feed grains you're producing, again, adding value and then, you know, exporting that final product. Um, our top six markets are very, you know, heavily focused on the products that you are producing. And that's a good thing. And that also indicates why trade is so important um, to pay attention to in the news and trade policy is so important to follow as part of managing your business day to day. Really, agriculture is dependent upon trade in a lot of ways. 20% of ag production is exported in a typical year, and, and the amount of, of particular commodity that is exported varies dramatically, um, but sector-wide, it becomes a large portion of the income that we're bringing in, um, again, for the farms that we're working to support by developing those overseas markets. Um, cotton, which I know many of you probably also produce, much of that goes overseas. Wheat, you know, it gets into about half. And then when you look at, you know, just commodity corn and, and some of the meat products, it's a much smaller percentage of overall production in the US. We consume a lot here as well. Um, but still, that, that even small percentage does have an impact on demand that has has an outsized influence on price. It also has an influence on basis um, on a more kind of year to year, you know, month to month, year to year type basis. Um, exports can, you know, impact basis in addition to impacting overall demand over the long term. So we're looking at short term sales, what's really happening right now, which is what Ryan's going to talk about a bit later, and the long term demand, what Kurt's going to talk about, and how we build that to benefit you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years in the future. This is important also because really, I, I always try to take it back to we are a trading nation. This is a fundamental part of who we are as Americans. Um, we were founded in part based on trade. Um, we have always had a very um, interactive uh, relationship with other countries at an economic level. Um, and it really is part of who we are and how we kind of have conceptualized ourselves and built ourselves to participate in a global economy. After World War II, we certainly helped build many of the institutions that now we take advantage of on, on trade issues, including the WTO. Um, we helped set those rules. And oftentimes, I think, you know, we look at the challenges of those institutions and forget that we built them in our own image and to benefit us, and they have disproportionately benefited us. Um, they continue to be an important part of the trade and export picture. 
And I think, you know, it's also important to point out that Americans generally know this. We look at, um, this is a relatively recent, done this year survey uh, from Gallup that asked Americans, what do you think of trade, basically? Do you think it is an opportunity for economic growth or do you think it's a threat? And over the last several years, you know, we've heard a lot of conversation about trade in our political uh, environment, much more so than we really had previously for several decades. Um, trade has become a very salient topic all across the board, every party, every conversation. Um, and it's interesting to see, like, what do Americans really make of all of that. Um, and what we're seeing is, is that Americans seem to be realizing that our economy is integrated with the world, um, that we are an export powerhouse in certain sectors, including agriculture. Um, and while we import a lot, also having that reciprocal and you know often bilateral relationship with other countries is an important part of our um, standard of living. It's, it's an important part of our economy. It's an important part of our growth going forward. One of the reasons for that is obviously jobs. So we look at this um, and say, you know, how have ag exports specifically supported jobs? So we know ag exports help drive profitability on the farm and they help drive farm income. Um, but what does that really look like off the farm? And this chart, I think, is important to point out for any of you who are speaking with non-farm audiences, which really could be even people in your own community who don't necessarily um, have a job directly tied to the farm, but indirectly maybe related to agriculture, or people who don't think they have any relationship at all to agriculture and don't realize how pervasive the impact of food and ag is in our, our wider economy. So the purple line you see is jobs related to farming, um, but that orange line is non-farm jobs. And ag exports, through the various processes that have to happen to get those exports overseas, as well as all of the processing and transportation and all of those other industries related to agriculture, but not specifically on the farm, that is driving jobs in this country um, just as much as many other sectors that we think of as driving jobs. It's important to realize how important agriculture actually is to our broader economy and make sure we're talking about that um, with all kinds of audiences. So again, when we're talking about demand, we're looking at population and Kurt will talk about this a little bit earlier. What really causes demand? And, uh, you know, to start with, it is people who need to eat, animals who need to eat, vehicles that need to be energized. Um, and where are those people and where are they growing in wealth? Because when you go from a little bit of money to slightly more money, the first thing you want is better food and better transportation. Um, again, Kurt will get into this a bit more, but that, that fundamental picture of demand is important to remember. As well as where are we seeing people move up that, that chain and say, you know, I want more protein, I want better protein, meat, milk, and eggs, which directly then requires more feed grains. Um, and this shows, you know, what you're looking at meat consumption per capita and you're seeing where some of those countries are being able to develop in that way and have access to more and better food for their, their own populations. So one of my favorite quotes about the work that we do is, you know, markets don't just happen, you have to work to make them happen. And that's a key fundamental part of our work. That's why we're out in markets. And frankly, that's why we're, you know, working so closely with Texas Corn and other members um, to share information between U.S. producers and the consumers of those products overseas. Um, because it's, it, you can count on a market to do certain work, but it, you also have to push it along. And what that really looks like in our world is trade policy and market development. So if we want sales to go from X to Y, um, the impediments to that um, really are market development constraints. So knowledge, um, opportunities, ability to use a product, awareness of a product, um, as well as trade policy, which really does set the rules of the road for what you can do in a market. It says what can come in and what can't, at what price, um, and under what conditions. And so we work on both sides of that equation um, to really ultimately get to sales. What we've seen with trade policy, which again is a very hot topic right now, and I think will continue to be, 
um, is that we know when we have more and better access um, and, and more preferential tariff treatment specifically, um, that can increase U.S. ag exports. We've seen it over time, um, again, throughout the post-war period. So this chart is an interesting one because it shows those major agreements and what happened, and then the shift in ag exports that occurred afterwards. It also shows the shift in ag imports because, of course, we are a large importer um, of products that we do produce in many cases, but not in the right season or whatever. We are both an importer and an exporter. And we can see that trade policy pushes both of those, but overall it allows us to export more than we import. Um, and it allows our exports to grow, up, uh, to grow up at a faster rate. That is the power of having access. We know that um, of all of the U.S. feed grains in all forms exported in the last full marketing year, so that's you know corn, sorghum, barley, as well as those meat products and ethanol, um, the countries, the 20 countries with which we have FTAs, purchased more than half of them. So for our sector in particular, that shows how important free trade agreements really are and having comprehensive trade policy um, is going to continue to be a large portion of our growth potential. Um, and also, I think it's important, noting, important to note that, as many of you know, agriculture is critical in this country to passing free trade agreements. Um, we have really helped push uh, the last several over the line, certainly over the last 10 years, um, and it's for this reason, because we know we will see benefits from them. So then we get into market development. So if trade policy gives us access, market development really helps us, you know, go down that road at a high rate of speed. Um, and the new reality in this time of, you know, COVID-19 is that a lot of that has shifted online. Ryan's going to talk about it a bit more, um, but this I just wanted you to see some of our global staff and see um, Ryan's highlighted there on, on one of the uh, pictures, you know, that there are things that we have to do in person. There's no question about that. And I think that we have learned over the last several months that an enormous amount of our work can also go online and in some ways we are able to reach people in that format that we were not able to reach before. Um, and so we're really exploring the opportunities that come from this situation. It's not something any of us would have planned or desired, but it is something um, that we have to live with and that we have to manage and something that we can learn a lot from and that's where our staff is really focused. Um, luckily, we were all used to working on our phones and computers anyway, um, so the shift was relatively seamless and you see, you know, folks kind of moving about with their work. During this time, we've really focused on, you know, back to basics, getting engaged with policy issues, many of which are still ongoing, despite the fact that many governments are also really focused on the pandemic. Um, trade servicing, helping people understand how to use the products that we are, are shipping them, making sure they know that we are open for business, dealing with any problems that come up, providing information about the market, providing information about access from the US after major events um, like you know, specific outbreaks or you know, the hurricane that just occurred, providing more market intelligence and really looking to our members for expertise that we can use to build out into the future. We're very much engaged with thinking about, okay, how do we make the most of this right now, but also how do we build and what's, what's going to come next because many parts of the world are facing really fundamental changes that will impact our work. Trade policy, as I said, continues despite a lot of focus by governments around the world on COVID-19. Um, some of this will come up a little bit later, but China phase one is underway and sales, especially of corn and sorghum are booming. USMCA did get finalized. It is entered into force as of July 1, and that's something we're very happy to see um, that will provide stable policy for Mexico and Canada's relationship with the United States over time. Negotiations continue with the United Kingdom, with Kenya, um, to some extent with the EU and India and Japan, and we're going to continue to engage in those and obviously press our priorities we have for each of those. Um, we have some issues with Brazil that we are working through. And then at the WTO level, which is really kind of the base, if you don't have a trade agreement, you're working on WTO rules. Um, that institution is really in a, in a change point right now. Um, it's in the process of finding a new director general, and we are watching that very closely and working um, to influence that in, in ways that would be beneficial as well. The other thing is, you know, this, this uh, kind of crisis time has really highlighted the need for information. 
Um, our overseas customers have just seen, you know, huge demand for information from them, which our market, our offices and consultants are obviously able to directly service. Um, and we are able to work with our members like Texas Corn in the US um, to be able to provide that information to our offices. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of information demand from folks in the US saying, okay, what's happening overseas and how is this gonna impact um, what our markets look like in the future? And so we're doing, you know, undertaking various tactics to try to, you know, take advantage of that moment and give people the information that they need and want, um, but also cognizant that this is an opportunity to continue to grow people's overall knowledge about trade. So we're really excited to be talking about what trade and exports really mean for our sector um, and what that's going to look like in the future where we know we need to build overseas and we also know there are going to be real changes in a lot of those countries and those economies. Um, I would just leave you before I turn it over to my colleagues, um, you know, with we have lots of resources on our website. Um, we try to post regularly on social media. We obviously share information um, with Texas and other member states and, and, and frankly, agribusinesses within our membership as well, um, trying to uh, kind of demystify as much as we can about this um, and offer resources to understand not just what's going on right now in the news, but all of the context that has come into that over the course of years or decades. Um, we really, you know, are an organization in a lot of ways, we have many uh, experts on staff um, who are fascinating to listen to. We try very hard to connect those to you um, and to let you know that you have real professionals working on your behalf in these markets um, and to answer the questions you have, because that is, um, that is a key, key part of our work. So these are some of the resources. This is actually linked. And um, if I, I think this presentation will go out, you should be able to click on these links. Otherwise, we welcome you to come to grains.org. Um, and we'll continue to provide those as well. I'll be happy to take any questions after this is over about these kind of bigger picture concepts, but right now we want to get into um, that market development piece in a bit more depth and then an update on what is really happening right now. And so for that, I'm going to turn it over to Kurt Schultz, who will talk about market development. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, again, I, I appreciate having the opportunity to speak to you today. Just wanted to talk a little bit about market development for Now, let's try okay. that again. Sorry. Yeah, let me know if it gets any. Uh, I can see that. But let me let me go ahead and and go to the next slide. Um, we're going to start. Um, can you advance the slide? Kurt, we we are still having some audio difficulties. Um. Okay. Why don't we do this? Um, I'm going to. Um, Hey, Melissa, why don't we skip to ahead to Ryan and I can call in on my phone and see if I can uh, get a better connection on that. And that works here. Yeah. Ryan. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Am I coming through loud and clear? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. All right, well, uh, Kurt's going to talk uh, it, it's about some of the, uh, the forward horizon markets that, that we're working on. And I'd like to talk about the, the here and now. Before I get started, I just want to uh, thank both uh, the, the Chekhov and the association for your support. It's always great to, uh, to get to share the work that, that we're doing with you. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Let's go ahead and go into the first slide, please. So uh, this is a look at, at, at where we're working, why we're working where we are. We, the Grains Council works in a lot of undeveloped and underdeveloped markets. And if you look at this graph, and I'll tell you a little bit about what, what it's showing here, the beige shaded area at the bottom shows the number of people living in extreme poverty. 
Uh, the top orange uh, shaded area, it shows the people that are not living in extreme poverty. And you can see that uh, over the years, the number of people living in extreme poverty has trended down and there are more and more people coming out of poverty. And as, as Melissa mentioned earlier, they're able to afford meat on a, on a periodic basis. And, and to, uh, you know, obviously to produce that meat, we need grains and feeds. And uh, if you look at the blue line, uh, that shows the U.S. agricultural exports to the world. And you can see right there, there's a direct correlation to the number of people coming out of poverty and the increase of U.S. agricultural exports to the world. So it tells us that we are working in the, in the right spots around the world, in these undeveloped and in underdeveloped uh, nations that are, that are working to, uh, to feed their populations, to bring more and more people out of this extreme poverty, and, uh, and to be able to feed them more nutritious meals that includes meat, meat, meat protein products. Next slide, please. Uh, Melissa showed this at this, this slide at the start, but I want to draw your attention to the India uh, location. We are, we are looking to open up our newest office in New Delhi, India. We have a person staged in Singapore right now, and uh, her name is Alejandra Danielson. She is uh, just waiting to, to get the final approvals on the office in, in India before moving over to Delhi. Uh, we, we started to clear some of the major hurdles that were out there. Um, and, and, and get through some of the government uh, approval processes. And then COVID hit, and that just kind of put the brakes on everything. So we're waiting on, on activities to resume as normal there, there in India. And, um, and as soon as they do, hopefully we'll get that approval and, and we'll be moving Alejandra in there. From that office, they're, they're, she's gonna not, India is the prize market there, and that's, that's what we're really after. But you can't forget about Bangladesh. They're, they're turning into a big distiller's grains uh, customer for us and, and could be, uh, could be a, a good corn customer for us as well. Pakistan is in that region, shows a little bit of promise for, for ethanol. And uh, Sri Lanka and Nepal, uh, smaller countries in that region that, that could pro provide some incremental demand. But India is the real prize. That's what we're after. They, they have a, a robust ethanol program there. They have an E10 blending mandate, but they're not able to fulfill that mandate. They can only produce about 4%. They can only get up to about E4 nationwide with their local production, but they don't allow imports for fuel. They're a, they're a large ethanol market for us, a top three or four uh, ethanol market, depending on the year, but it's all for industrial purposes. So we're trying to show the, the Indian government how they can exhaust all of the local supplies that they have and then still have room to uh, go out to the international market buy what they need to meet that E10 mandate that they already have in place. And that will do a, a number of things, It'll, it, including saving the government money on uh, their Forex expenditures. They're buying toxic chemicals like MTBE and aromatics to mix into their gasoline. They're buying that on the foreign market. Well, ethanol is a much cleaner and affordable option for them. And we're, we're telling them, look, you know, you can save well into the hundreds of millions of dollars as a government of India uh, by replacing these toxic compounds with, with clean burning ethanol. So we're, we, we've been doing a lot of work and, and there's a lot more work to go, but India shows real promise in growing from what is now, uh, I think about a 300 million, two, two, 300 million gallon market or so, uh, up to, there's a lot more potential there. Let's, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Just to look at where U.S. corn is going, Mexico has, has been our top customer for, for many years, and I know that's a very important market to you. It is to me, too. I lived there for 10 years, traded for Gavilon, and then, and then as I mentioned, uh, running the, the council's office in Mexico City there. Uh, boy, it's just been tremendous to see the growth uh, since, since the signing of NAFTA, and the growth in their livestock and their feed milling capacity has just been outstanding, and, and that has that has been enabled through the availability of affordable, reliable grain shipments from the United States. So it's been great to have that partnership over the years. Glad to see USMCA signed that, that provides certainty for not only our top market in, in Mexico, but our number five corn market in Canada as well. It's a, that's an important one. A lot, a lot of focus is, is uh, on Mexico and I'm sure certainly being there in Texas with the border there, 
Uh, that's where a lot of the focus is. We can't forget about Canada. They're a big corn customer and, and a distiller grains customer. Uh, Japan is, uh, is, has been you know, a, a top source of demand for many years as well. South Korea, uh, Colombia are, are big customers. One that's not on there, and I'll get into in here in just a little bit, is China. They've made a push recently. Uh, they're not even on this, on this slide anywhere that I see. So uh, they, they are now. This is a snapshot of the 2018-19 crop year, but they're gonna, they're gonna make it on future iterations of, of this slide for sure. Next slide, please. And here's what I was talking about. Mexico, number one, Japan, Colombia, South Korea, but look, China has made an appearance in this current 2019-20 crop year that we're finishing up right now. Uh, exports started out very, very slow at, at the start of this crop year, but we saw a major push towards uh, the end of this year, last half of this year, really from January forward. And the emergence of China has been, has been really good to see. Uh, we, need, we need to focus on market share in areas like Southeast Asia. They're nowhere to be seen on here or the previous slide. Uh, North Africa is another one. And market share is one that's difficult for us to, to work on because, uh, you know, a lot of times it does just come down to dollars and cents. And there are, there are periods of the year when Brazil, Argentina, Ukraine are extremely competitive versus U.S. origins. Uh, so, but there are some things that we're working on, such as starch availability, starch extractability that are showing some promising initial results. We need to prove some of this out, but we're, going to, we're hoping to set about the world showing customers that, uh, that we have better starch content and better starch availability in our corn versus that of our competitors. So look for that in, in the months to come. Next slide, please. Here's a look at some of the successes that we've seen. Uh, recently, we hosted the Global Ethanol Summit in October of last year. I believe we had uh, 400 international buyers and policymakers from over 60 countries come into Washington, D.C. to uh, learn about the U.S. ethanol supply, uh, learn about what's going on here. And there were actually several million dollars of sales made at that event and after that event as a result of, of bringing all those buyers and policymakers together. So we're going to be looking to continue that. USMCA, as I mentioned, uh, provides certainty in, in, in two very, very important markets. Moving down to Peru, you know, one thing that we've seen recently is a lot of these countervailing duty, that's what the CVD stands for, countervailing duty cases and anti-dumping cases that uh, countries are bringing up uh, around the world against our corn, against our ethanol. Well, Peru's government decided uh, on their own, you know, without any well, there, there was not a, a petitioner in this case. No one filed this case on behalf of Peruvian industry. It was just the Peruvian government. They decided they were going to bring a countervailing duty case against our corn and, and attempt to apply tariffs uh, to, to our corn entering. And that's our seventh largest market. So it's very important to keep that open. I went down there and testified twice in front of their government. We were working in conjunction with FAS. Um, with uh, national corn, with a lot of the, the state corn uh, associations and checkoffs, uh, to really bring a good defense of our programs, of our government programs, how they work, and to prove that the exports of U.S. corn to Peru caused no harm, no injury to the Peruvian industry. Actually, we pro proved that it was quite a benefit, especially to their livestock and feed milling sectors, to have that access to our corn. And we won that case. We don't win them all. Uh, there are some that, that, that we've left with a, a small duty or sometimes even a prohibitive duty, but this one was a real success. The, the Peruvian government decided to drop this case completely. There will be no appeals and there will be no tariffs added to our corn going into our seventh largest market. So we're really happy to see that happen. That happened at the start of this year. US-China phase one trade deal. I'll talk a little bit more about that on my last slide. But uh, th that's been good to see. You've seen the corn sales to China. We need some other products to come along to really uh, you know, up those totals for, that, for those phase one commitments that they've, that they've made. Uh, but uh, glad to see that, those, that the, our products are going over there right now. Southeast Asia distillers grain sales, they're getting close to 4 million tons of distillers grains imports from the United States as a region. 
Now, just to put that in a little bit of context, Mexico is our top customer as a standalone country, and they import 2 million tons of distiller's grains. So Southeast Asia as a region, there are several countries in there, they, they nearly double what, what, what Mexico is taking, and it's very important for, for us to stay engaged there and not only promote the traditional distiller's grains that we've been doing for many years there, but also some of these high pro products we're, we're promoting. You, you end up into the 40s and 50% percent protein on some of these distiller's grains. And you know, we're, we're competing against products that we never competed against before. And, and going into uh, sectors that we, that we never did, like aquaculture. You know, aquaculture is a very large untapped demand source for distiller's grains and for high pro distiller's grains. So we have a, a very well-known aquaculture consultant on board full-time in the region now to, to really help, help continue to increase sales in that region. Japanese ethanol purchases, that's, that's been a big one as well. Just, just three to four years ago, Japan did not allow, allow any U.S. ethanol content in the ETBE that they're, that they're importing. So what was happening was they're, import, the, they're importing an ETBE product from, from the port of Houston, from Lyon del Basel. The Lyon del Basel was buying 100% Brazilian ethanol, imported into Houston, blended into this uh, ETBE mix, and then shipped to, to Japan. Well, we worked with FAS, with Growth Energy, with RFA, and with, again, with, with some of the state corn associations to have Japan take another look at their life cycle assessment. Have, have them truly realize the benefits of, of, of corn ethanol and the greenhouse gas savings that can be realized with greater efficiencies that we're seeing in our production these days. And so Japan agreed. Uh, they agreed with our arguments and they allowed up to 44% of, um, of the ETBE content to come in with US ethanol. So since that happened just a little over a year ago, uh, we're getting all 44% all of what's allotted to us in, the, in that mix. And then just recently, earlier this year, we had them take another look at it. And they've now increased that by another 20%. And so what we're looking at a total now, once this is finally you know, written into law there in Japan, and, and that's, that'll be coming soon. Uh, we're looking at about a 140 million gallon ethanol market in Japan, uh, again, through the ETBE blend. They have a large industrial ethanol market as well that, that we've yet to attack, and that's 190 million gallons on top of that. So we're gonna be looking to take that away. We're not getting much of, of that at all. Uh, that's, that's going to Brazil. And so we're looking for ways right now how we can get a much larger share of that pie that we're getting. Next slide. Where's ethanol going? Brazil is, is our top market, followed by Canada. India, as I mentioned, that's importing the, the industrial ethanol. European Union, since they've done away with some of the tariffs that they had in place, has come back. And then followed by South Korea is, is, that has seen some major uh, increases recently too. They're importing for industrial not for fuel, and they're also importing for re-exports to other nations in, in the region. Uh, but I want to focus here on Brazil quickly, and I know we're, we're, we're getting probably close to time, so I'll, I'll wrap it up here shortly, but uh, Brazil has us very, very concerned. They have a tariff rate quota in place whereby uh, 200 million gallons approximately can go into Brazil uh, tariff-free, and then anything above that is hit with a 20% tariff. Well, that TRQ is expiring on August 31st. And the Brazilian government is pretty much prepared to slap a 20% tariff on every single gallon of US ethanol going into that market. We've been working very closely with USTR, with USDA, the administration to try and get them to reverse course. Uh, but to be honest with you, it is not looking good. I've been saying for the past year or so, we need to continue to find other markets because we cannot depend on Brazil. And unfortunately, they could very well leave the, the top spot or even the top five of our, of our ethanol uh, export markets if this 20% tariff goes into place. So keep an eye on that. That decision's coming maybe even tonight if they want to do a, a, a news dump at, you know, tonight when, when they think nobody's going to read it. Uh, so, so we'll see. Next slide, please. China has come on in a major, major way for new crop corn purchases. 
at present uh, for the for new crop, we are, are seeing some of the highest sales on record for this time of year. Uh, off to a, just a blazing start. They, they have already, if you look at that, they've bought almost 8 million tons. And that, that includes a, uh, a three quarter of a million ton purchase that they made just yesterday and a couple of record purchases that they made last month. Uh, they had, if, you, if you were to look back at that, that old crop uh, graph that I showed earlier, with these 8 million tons, China has already cemented themselves as our number three buyer for the coming corn crop. So good to see, we've got to see the execution on it. And again, I, I keep saying it's, it's very early, but we are off to a very, very good start for new crop sales. Mexico and Japan, we expect them to come up to uh, typical volumes as the year progresses. Next slide, please. This is my last slide, I'll stop here, but you know, we all know about phase one, just wanted to have a little check in on progress here uh, with what China is doing. You saw that they made the, the, the big push at the end of this crop year and, and imported just over uh, 2 million tons. They have 8 million tons on the books uh, for the upcoming crop. Sorghum, uh, they have come back to this market and they've shown time and time again when they're in the market, they're going to be our top customer. Uh, but healthy tonnage for, for this past crop and are already off to a very, very good start for the upcoming one. The stillers, grains, and ethanol are still lacking. They have bought nothing. There's an anti-dumping and countervailing duty case against our distillers' grains. It's preventing that to go in. We're working to get that removed. Ethanol, I keep hearing Q4. I keep, keep hearing fourth quarter they're going to be buying. I'll believe it when I see it. Um, but that, uh, that could be, I mean, China can, theoretically, they could buy a billion gallons from us. Uh, realistically, 500 million gallons is very, very realistic, realistic for Chinese ethanol purchases. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but, uh, you know, this China's telling us that their demand is there, at least on the grain side. We need them to come along on the distillers and the ethanol. That's what I have today, and I'll turn it over to Kurt. Um, uh, just a quick question before I get started. Do we, um, I know time is a little bit tight. Do, David or, or Wesley, do we want to go to questions or would you like me to proceed with my presentation? Um, let's go ahead and go through and um, if we can just try to try to be wrapped up. Okay. Three to five oh. minutes before. Okay, yeah. I'll go try to go through this quickly. Um, okay, let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to give an aspect of one side of it, which is market development and focus on future demand building because there is the existing demand. Um, Ryan sort of gave a, an example of some of the projects that we're working on, on on existing opportunities, but how do we build growth for the future, set the stage for future growth? And so I'm going to focus on Africa. I at the end of the presentation, I'll talk briefly a little bit about Mexico because obviously that's a, a more closer and relevant to, to the Texas market. But you know, when you look at Africa, you're going to see an additional uh, 1.3 billion people added be, um, before 2050. And so there's significant growth occurring there. And, and one other point I just want to highlight is that Africa and the Middle East uh, account for about 50% of the future uh, coarse grain growth between now and 2026. And this is um, from USDA's long-term outlook. And so there's a lot of uh, dynamics that are, are, are setting up the stages for this. Uh, Melissa, let's go to the next. And so you've seen this slide, you see Asia down in, in the red, um, uh, population growth starts to, to decline or overall population while Africa continues to grow. And so that's really one of the dynamics that's driving this. Let's go to the next. Um, and just also just to give you a real um, kind of a glimpse into the complexity of Africa. We have one office in this region, but yet you, you were to stack uh, China, United States, India, and uh, parts of Europe in here, you could fit them all into the continent. So it is a huge geographical area um, and uh, very different in North versus South. Uh, let's go to the next. So um, as, as I, we look at future demand growth, and this is a, 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 a basically looking at geographical areas and their total compound feed production, you see relatively developed markets in Latin America, North America, Europe, and Asia. 
uh, you know, Asia being the largest at almost 40 million metric tons of compound feed produced annually, whereas Africa and the Middle East and the center are really small. So this, I like this just because it, it highlights the, de the, the size of the potential um, when you look at population is there, but um, really underdeveloped uh, livestock uh, sectors. Let's go to the next slide. And so one of the things that the council likes to, uh, you know, slogans is that the council goes and works where the market doesn't. You know, if the market worked, in a lot of ways, there wouldn't be a need for us to be there. Um, we're there to solve problems. And it can be, in, in, this, in this case, in the sense of market development and developing uh, future markets um, to the benefit of the U.S. industry. And it can be prob solving problems like the CBD case um, or, or even uh, fumigation issues that arise in markets where um, it, it requires multiple uh, players in the industry to be involved and, and to, to resolve an issue. Let's go ahead to the next. So historically, um, and, and I was based in North Africa for seven years in the Tunis office. And so we traditionally work in these blue countries um, where uh, it's, it's a dry climate and they, they have to import feed grains either from the United States, Europe, or the, uh, South America. To, to feed uh, their uh, livestock industry. So it was, a, uh, and they're, they're growing and they're still growing, um, but they're much more advanced than let's say the Sub-Saharan um, African markets. So let's go to the next one. Um, if we look at, now I'm gonna kind of pivot towards South, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, if we're looking at feed industry development, we kind of work in four cornerstones. You know, how do you develop a quality feed that the industry trusts and will spend money on rather than making it themselves? Um, how do you, uh, you know, work with associations to develop a professional association that can represent the industry and uh, promote their development to the government? How do you improve consumer confidence in the, in the quality of the meat and, and feed safety? And how do you build an effective and modern feed industry that will be ultimately a customer of the U.S. by, by going and buying vessels of corn rather than, and being of the size that they're able to do that? And so that's sort of what, you know, kind of we're working in those four cornerstones. Let's go to the next. And so this is, um, you saw the blue slides, um, and now we're kind of looking at Sub-Saharan Africa. And our current engagement is looking at West Africa, which is importing grain already, um, but in a lot of countries, and then East Africa, where there's, these are two kind of the economic um, uh, fastest growing and developing areas. They're also coastal areas. We don't go into the center of the of African continent because transportation just makes uh, U.S. grain uncompetitive. We don't go to necessarily to South Africa because they have their own production. And so we're really looking at the opportunities in these two uh, regions as the, the starter areas for growth. And there's a lot, of, a lot of investment going there. Let's go to the next slide. And so um, this is a, a really a snapshot of what we're, one of the things that we're trying to deal with. The, the picture on the left is a, a, a um, uh, feed producer, obviously very small scale producer. Um, and, and it's a very messy operation. I don't have a video of the whole operation, but it was just a, a lot of room for a very poor quality feed. And the, the, the feed mill on the right actually exists in, in the region. And so what we're trying to do is to break this cycle, move away from these small um, informal producers to a more formalized production, uh, clean, sanitary, better quality production. Uh, uh, poultry producers feel much more comfortable buying um, somebody with a consistent quality feed. Let's go to the next. Um, and so I just, the next two slides are kind of showing, um, these are, this is corn imports by uh, Morocco. Uh, we started getting involved there in 1994. And since at that time they imported about 500,000 tons of corn. And since then, um, we went and, and actually uh, got involved with the poultry and dairy sector over a 20 year period. And we've seen imports of corn uh, uh, increase sixfold. And it's really about building um, the, the industry. I would just use one small example. Um, we had a success story this last week of a company that, we, that I actually was working with that, in, that is gonna import 4 million tons of, I'm sorry, 4 million dollars of cattle from the United States. They're hosting uh, heifers. And uh, so we were looking back at their, um, their history. And over the last 10 years, this company has imported about $20 million a year from the United States of, of corn, soybeans, 
uh, uh, dairy genetics or our semen and, and obviously the livestock we're talking about. And so if you can go in and work on it, that's just on one company basis. And if you can work with them and get them to modernize and move up the production uh, channel, then that, can, that has a spread effect. Let's go to the next. Uh, we also worked in Egypt and, and going back a little bit further, uh, Egypt is the largest corn market in the region. And um, starting in 85, uh, we started working, it was about 2 million tons of, of imports and now they're, they're uh, rapidly approaching 10 million tons. Not all of this is US corn, but I just wanted to show the dynamic of the growth that has occurred over time. Uh, let's go to the next. I'm not sure if this video will work, but yeah, let's click that and start. Not sure if the audio is working. Yeah, I don't know if they, uh, anyways, well, this is running. Um, we just uh, shipped uh, 60 tons of US sorghum to Kenya. Uh, really what we're trying to do, and it's coming out of Texas, um, and uh, we are uh, trying to open up a new market in East Africa for U.S. Uh, sorghum. And so this, is, this uh, uh, sorghum is en route. The USDA allowed us uh, through a program to buy it, purchase this sorghum and ship it in. And we're going to be doing feeding trials uh, in Kenya to, to show the industry um, not only the benefits of using U.S. sorghum, but how uh, one of the constraints that they face is their cost of feed is very expensive. And so, um, this was just happened to, to happen last week, and I just wanted to highlight uh, that uh, program. Um, and th that is an example of how the council works. Let's let's go through um, the the next uh, slide um, and skip skip this one um, and to the next one. Basically, this is some pictures from from actually East Africa of a poultry produ producer that we have helped uh, increase his production and a feed mill on the left that uh, we're working with to, as you can see, very good quality uh, uh, production there. And so the idea is to develop markets for long term um, business for U.S. farmers to enable trade. And in, in the end, we improve lives uh, both in the United States and overseas. Um, and that is the mission statement of the council. I'm going to stop there. We have about uh, five minutes left. And um, so let's just stop there and, and open it up for questions. OK, uh, thank you. Thank you guys for uh, presenting this, this program. Uh, Wesley, do you have an immediate question? I've got two or three here in my office that are, that I've received. Okay, maybe if Wesley has some, we'll get him on. Are you there? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, as the global pandemic has gone on and the inability to, for international travel, and that's been really a mainstay of the council of taking individuals from the states and NCGA and U.S. Grains Council officers and A-team people, uh, but not being able to travel, you've probably increased the efficiency of communications through what you're doing. Uh, do you still feel that's, is that gonna improve the ability to go into the future and then use international travel on top of what you're able to do now? I'll take that. Thanks. Thanks for the question. And, and Melissa and Kurt, um, chime in if you'd like. But, uh, you know, we've learned, we've certainly learned a lot. Obviously, we would, we would love to be traveling like we did for the, we have for the past 60 years. We just can't right now. So we're playing the hand that's been dealt us. We've gone to virtual seminars and conferences everywhere we go or every, with every activity that we're doing. And we're getting large turnouts. We're, we're getting much larger turnouts than we would in a lot of cases in person. Uh, so it's, it's been great that we're reached, able to reach wide audiences. And I think when we're able to go back uh, to travel, we're going to be offering hybrid models where those that are, that are there in person that want to go in person can do that. And then those that can't, for whatever reason, will be able to log in and see the work that we're doing. And I think we'll be able to reach even broader audiences that way. Thank you. That's... I assume that there will be some positives come out of this, and that's what I was hoping to hear as we move into the future, that how you can make it work better for everybody. There are some silver linings. Okay. Um, so with the, with the rapid, or to me, that's a rapid increase in purchases by China. How, how do you, 
how would you assume or predict that those will actually come to fruition, the corn will really be shipped? Because I think the demand is there. The demand is there. They've been drawing down their stocks. You look at their local, their local corn auctions, uh, for the past several weeks, and this week was the first exception in many, many weeks, they've offered up 4 million tons of local Chinese corn for sale at increasing prices every week, much, much higher. I mean, you're talking seven to $8 a bushel is what they're selling it at. And they're selling 100% of it every single week with the exception of this week, I think they sold 89%, something like that. That demand is there. They lost a lot of their hog, hog herd with ASF. That is starting to rebuild. But during that time, a lot of poultry operations came online and those will remain. The demand's there. Okay. Uh, I had a question. Asked, I've had this asked before, and I've never really thought to ask you guys for an answer. But, you know, we see these uh, sales listed by USDA. Some are listed to China or Mexico or Canada. Others are all non-disclosed. Uh, explain why they're that way and how you really get a handle on, on that. Or destination to be announced or we hear yeah i i think it i think it's um it, it it could be a couple of things and you know kurt let me know if, if you've got any other ideas here but it's um you know it's countries that, that don't want to tip their hand um uh, that, it, that it's going to their country um or it's those that want to keep an arbitrage option open uh, that you know they they could they could buy it and with the intention of shipping to China, but the market changes and they need to go to Japan or Mexico or somewhere else. Um, so that's what that's a lot of that. That's what's going on. Kurt, do you have any other insight on that? I would just say that sometimes the the um, data doesn't come out and initially also, and so they do clarify those later when 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 the first report comes in. Um, you might see it weeks later that they clarify. Um, re, you know, this was an undisclosed location. Now it's being reported, but so all those are, are options on that. Okay, uh, I've got one more question or a comment for y'all to chime in on. You know, here in Texas we traditionally in our corn market, we're a net importer, but we know we have, uh, we don't export a lot of our corn except to Mexico, but mycotoxins are a problem uh, for us. What do you, you might explain how that's dealt with on a worldwide basis, what some of the requirements are uh, dealing with specifically probably aflatoxin or fumonacin. Uh, that's that's a that's a tough uh, question in the sense that I'm not sure what the the international standard is. Obviously, I think uh, you know the U.S. we we test aflatoxin at export and um, and basically when we work with the international feed uh, companies, it's it's knowing what your inputs are. Um, you know, as you know, um, if you receive uh, high mycotoxin grain, you you just find a way to feed it and dilute it out as you as you feed it. So really. Um, when you're dealing with a sophisticated feed industry, they they work around it. Now it does cause problems, let's say in distillers grains where there may be more concentration of it, um, but uh, we really haven't had, um, I, I guess when I first started, there was a lot more uh, pushback in some of the, the emerging markets on, on mycotoxins. But I think nowadays um, it's, it's understood, um, it's just in any grain, or any corn that you receive. And so you need to really uh, understand your raw materials and, and manage it appropriately. Okay. Well, I think we're right at our time to wrap up. We certainly appreciate y'all, uh, Ryan, Kurt, and Melissa for uh, joining us today. Uh, we appreciate those that logged in. And if you have any other questions you'd like to send to us, we'll forward and get responses. Again, uh, remember this will be videoed and uh, we hope that uh, we wish you all the best. Have a great weekend and uh, hopefully all these sales that are being announced in China come to fruition because uh, you know, we're kind of in a mix right now, not knowing what our corn crop is after the storms in the Midwest and that. But even at that, it looks like we're gonna have a big pile and we really need to ship it out on behalf of our producers. So thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Thank, Thank you. you. All.